to picture a wilderness, a, a desert place, somewhere that's arid and dry, a place where life is difficult. There, there isn't a whole lot of life. It's, it's hard to find food and water. It's a difficult place to live. It's a kill or be killed type of environment. You look out for number one or you're done. You know, it's, it's a desolate wasteland, kind of like those pictures shown in the, the movies and the old movies from Mad Max, and I'm, I'm assuming in the new one as well, where there's not a whole lot of life to be had there. People are always out to protect themselves. It's a competition for everything. They have to make sure they get their own, and they might work with someone for a while if it's beneficial to them. But you're really looking out for yourself in this, in this situation. Because you see, this in this world, or in this <clears throat> desolate wasteland, it's, life is harsh. You know, the only thing it has to offer is, is hopelessness and despair, brokenness and heartache. It is a hard place to live. When you're in the desert, the only thing to be found in the end is searing and death. You see, it's a place where it can be a struggle to make it through life, to make it through the next month the next day, the next hour, the next minute. And life seems so fragile, so temporary, so easy to lose. And so you're always watching your back because you feel like you can't trust anyone. And it's just a, a really hard place to live. But one day as you're out in this wilderness, as you look around and, and that's all you see, you hear the whispers, rumors of a, an oasis in the middle of this desert. And people that live there, sometimes they venture out and they come to the people in the wilderness and they bring them back into that oasis because that's how they too have ended up there. And you hear this story and you, you sort of laugh at it and scoff it off. It seems too fanciful to be true. You, you look at the world around you and who would offer up the abundance that they have to, to people they don't even know? Who would offer this kind of benefit to anybody? But you, know, you, you continue your, your journey in this life and, and life starts to, to weigh down on you. You come to the end of yourself. It's, you can't make it through another day. You've just given up hope because a life filled with competition and, and endlessly running this rat race of trying to prove yourself and prove who you are just ends up leaving you empty and hollow. And as you begin to, to faint, you look out and you see somebody walking towards you. And the next thing you know, you wake up and you're in this oasis, and a man is, or a person is standing next to you, and they say, don't worry, I have brought you here. I have brought you into this place of life, this place of abundance. This is now who you are. You're free to stay here. All that we have is yours. That life of scarcity, that life of competition out in the wilderness is no longer who you are. And as you regain your strength, you, you look around and you see plenty of water and food. You see walls around this oasis that protect you from the threats of the wilderness. And the people that live there, they're, they're kind and generous. They have a certain kind of peace in their life that you've, you've never seen before. I want you to, to hold those two pictures in your mind and, and realize that in Scripture, the, the picture of the oasis is the picture of the life we have in Christ. And, and the picture of the wilderness that searing in death is, is all that we're offered in, in our lives apart from God. We really have nothing to hold on to. But you see, the, the question remains, how did you get into the wilderness? How do you get into this place? How did you and I end up in this life in Christ? You see, it wasn't our effort. We weren't able to buy our way in. We weren't able to do good works to earn our way into this, into this life. We can't sneak our way in. No, you see, we were brought in. Other people had to bring us there and Christ and God working through other people. You know, if you were baptized as a baby, then your family and friends brought you to the waters of baptism where God's name, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit was placed upon you and you were called his child. Or if you converted as an adult, then friends and family, coworkers, strangers, they, they spoke God's word and, and God worked that word into your heart so that you would believe in his name and that you would come to that life of abundance in the oasis. But when we get to the gate, it's never us that, that earns our way in. Rather, it is the blood of Christ that has paid the price for us to enter into this life of abundance. You see, but as you realize, you're in an oasis, but it's in the middle of the wilderness. It's, we're still in the world. We might, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. 
As Paul says in Romans 12, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your heart, by the renewing of your, your mind. See, we're resident aliens. We live in this world, but this is not our final home. You see, we're waiting for Christ to return and get rid of the sin and death and the brokenness of this world and renew this world to make it a new place where we dwell with him in his kingdom in this place. But that's not the reality we live in yet. And yet we still have this oasis where we can dwell in God and experience that peace that is found alone in him. And that happens as, as God's grace flows over you and you start to experience his love. It transforms your life from a life of, of insecurity and of trying to prove yourself, of, of trying to endlessly seek your own needs to a life of knowing that everything is yours, that you have life and life to the full in Christ. And, and as you begin to grow in the depth of your understanding of that life, as, as the gospel sinks in to your heart and, and the depth of the riches of, of God's love and wisdom moves into your heart, you start to be changed and you start to hear this, this message proclaimed and it becomes louder and louder. You, you hear God's grace that has been shared with you and you want to share it with other people. You see, in verse, 17, or verse 18 Jesus said, of the gospel, Jesus says, as you have sent me into the world, now I have sent them. Jesus invites us to join him in his mission. <clears throat> and this isn't the only place where we're invited to be a part of God's mission. It, it's throughout the whole Bible. It starts even in, in Genesis chapter 12 when God says to Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing to the other nations. Everyone will be blessed through you. You see, that's, that's what we're called into. And, and we get to be God's hands and feet out in the world sharing his message of grace and of love and of peace to those who are broken and lost and hurting. You know, it's interesting, as I was preparing for this sermon this week, and, and I was speaking to my dad about it, who happens to be in the back row here today. I'm going to call him out just once in a while. I get to, to have my parents in attendance. And, and he shared a story with me of, of Dresden, Germany. And, and during World War II, they were heavily bombed by the Allied forces. And this is a picture of the Lutheran church there after the, the bombing. And, and the whole city was in about this condition of, of desolation after the bombing. And as the people went through the rubble of this church, the only thing left standing was a statue of Christ, but the hands and the feet had been broken off. And as they went to rebuild the church, and, and, and it has been rebuilt, and it's a beautiful, beautiful church, they left the hands and the feet broken off of Christ's statue because they said, we are now the hands and feet of God out in the world. And that's true of you and I as well, of you and me as well. We are now God's hands and feet out in the world, reaching out to the lost, reaching out to the broken, offering them God's grace. You see, in the, 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 Jesus has called us out of this world, but he sends us back into the world to proclaim his message. But he hasn't just said, go out and do it by your own authority. Go out and do it by yourself. No, he prays to the Father, I send, I'm, I pray that not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them safe from the, from the evil one. He prays for our protection. That's in, in today's gospel lesson. And in John chapter 16, the, the chapter just before this, is where Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He says, you'll be clothed with power from on high. I will now dwell within you. You will be given the words to speak. My authority will now dwell in you. So that when you go out and you proclaim God, my word, when you go out and proclaim the gospel, I will be with you. I will give you the strength. I will give you the words. I will work through you. And so we go out with God's power within us into this world. We go back into the world. But going back into the wilderness, make no mistake about it, the wilderness is a dangerous place. You see, the wilderness is filled with earthly pleasures, with temptations, with self-gratifying ideals, things that we used to, to, to be drawn into and sometimes we're still drawn into. And so that's why Jesus prays that we would be protected, that we would be given that strength and, and that's why he equips us with the Holy Spirit. But you'll notice something as you go out and when you resist temptation, people will hate you. They'll hate you because you're not like them, because you do something different, because you have a peace they don't have. They hate you because Christ now dwells in you and because they hated Christ first. They hated him because they don't have what he has and they don't accept what he offers. <clears throat> and so as you go out into the wilderness and as you start to do kingdom work and you proclaim God's grace to those who don't know and as you, you help those in need, 
you'll notice something else happens. You see, Satan will come and he'll start to tempt you and he'll put you through trials and he'll try and, and frustrate your plans because Satan hates it when people are taken, when people are working to take people out of his kingdom of searing and of death and of desolation into God's kingdom of life and peace and hope and grace. Satan hates when that happens and so he always comes after those who are working for God's kingdom. That's why Jesus in verse 19, and, and this is my own paraphrasing of that verse, says, I, sanct I now sanctify, I make myself holy so that others might be made holy through me in the truth. He prays that, that we might be made holy. You see, he is holy, but now through his life, death, and resurrection, he is making us holy. He's setting us apart so that we might be made holy in him. And in verse 17, he says, I pray that you would sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. To be sanctified means to be set apart. Jesus is praying that, that we would be set apart in the truth. And that setting apart, like getting into his kingdom, comes at a cost. It doesn't cost us anything, but it costs him everything. He paid dearly so that we could be brought into his kingdom, so that we could be offered that life. And now we're sanctified in his word, in his truth. And, and he is the word. So he's sanctifying us in himself. He wants us to know that he is our life. He is salvation. He is where hope is found. He is what gives us life in this kingdom. And so we come to him for life. We come to him for hope. But how do we come back to that place? How do we continually get sanctified in the truth? How do we be sanctified in his word? We come to church. We come to this place. We go to the, the 4-H fairgrounds in Pratt. We go to house churches. We go to our Bible studies or, or to the midweek services. And we hear God's word spoken and proclaimed. We come to the Lord's table and receive the bread and wine, the true body and blood of Jesus Christ in, with, and under. And we receive his forgiveness, his grace, his life. We come to the waters of baptism where we are baptized into his life, death, and resurrection, and his name is placed upon us. And we remember our baptisms every morning as, as Luther tells us to do, making the sign of the cross and remembering that the claim he has made upon us as his children does not fail and cannot be taken from us. And when you know that, you can go back out into the world and fearlessly proclaim his grace, proclaim his love to those who've never heard, to those who need to hear that message. You see, this is a, a great but a very dangerous task. But it is a task worthy of risking life and death because it doesn't simply deal with our reputation or our Facebook friends or our social standing. No, it deals with the eternal things. And that's why we go back out as the church militant and fight the forces of evil. And I don't mean people and I don't mean ISIS, I, but I mean what Paul talks about in Ephesians. The spiritual forces, the princes, principalities and forces that are at work through people in this world. And so we go and we proclaim God's grace that can break the hardest of hearts, that can change people and bring them into his kingdom. We proclaim that hope. And we draw them to the true word that is Jesus Christ, that gives us life and offers them life and grace and forgiveness. See, that's what we have to offer. We can offer to people who are broken and hurting, full of sorrow and shame and guilt and weighed down by, by the competitive nature of our world. We can offer them the burden that, that Jesus says. He says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. Come and learn from me and I will give you peace. He offers that to everybody, and we get to offer that grace to the world. We get to offer what Jesus has given us. And when, you, when you've received that, when you know that truth, when you know that you are in his kingdom and who you are is unshakable, that your identity is in Christ and, and cannot be taken from you, you can go back out into the wilderness. You can go back into that place of trial and temptation and proclaim God's kingdom. You can be like the fourth century church father, John Chrysostom, as he was brought before the Empress Eudoxia who had threatened him with banishment if he refused to, to stop, to refuse to give up his independence as a Christian preacher. And this is how he responded. You cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. But I will kill you, said the Empress. No, you cannot, for my life is hidden in Christ with God. But I will take away your treasures. 
You cannot take away my treasures. For my treasure is in heaven and there is my heart also. But I will, I will send you away from all your friends and you will be isolated and alone. <laughs> no, you, you cannot. Because I have a friend in heaven from whom you cannot separate, separate me. No, I defy you for there is nothing you can do to harm me. You see, when we know that God is with us, that God is for us, we can be fearless. We can go out into that wilderness without fear and proclaim his kingdom, proclaim the truth that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. That is our story. That is our hope. We proclaim Christ crucified and Christ risen in victory. And so we can go back out into the world and share that good news and draw those who have never heard it into the, the, the loving arms of their father, of their heavenly father, welcome to their true home. We can go back out to our Christian brothers and sisters who have lost their way and remind them of God's grace. You see, you and I who have been, have been brought into God's oasis are free to go back out and, and share that grace and know that we can return safely into his arms. We know that his kingdom is unshakable. His mercies are new every morning. His grace is never ending and his love never fails. That is what we know. That is what we have received as a people in his kingdom. And so may that truth give you peace as you depart from this place back out into the world. May that love, may that truth give you courage and strength to share that message of hope with the world around you. Amen.